What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health, Tuesdays, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern, on Pacifica Affiliates, WXOJLPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD in Kasilof and Anchorage, Alaska. Produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project, streaming, podcasting, and archived at madnessradio.net. Welcome to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. And uh, today we're speaking with Jana Colley. Jana is a former social worker in mental health and a psychiatric abuse survivor. And she has a really fantastic um, blog that is very popular on the internet. It's called uh, Beyond Meds, and it talks about the coming off psychiatric drug process that we'll be getting into today on the show. So um, from North Carolina, thank you so much for joining us today on Madness Radio, Jana Colley. Thank you, Will. It's great to talk to you. You have to say your blog is just fantastic. It's one of the best blogs that I've come across. Your journal on the internet about your experiences with psychiatry and uh, the coming off medication process. And I want to give the URL for that um, so people can check it out. It's Bipolar Blast. B-I-P-O-L-A-R-B-L-A-S-T, Bipolar Blast, dot WordPress, W-R-D-P-R-E-S-S, WordPress, dot com. I guess tell us, you know, how all this got started. I mean, I know that you're a very popular blogger and very prolific and a great writer, and we're going to be hearing some of your writing a little bit um, later on the show. But tell us about your your experience as a psychiatric abuse survivor. How did you get into the mental health system and what what happened? Well, I got into the system by abusing um, illicit drugs um, when I was 19 years old. Was it psychedelics or hallucinogens or pot or what? Yeah, psychedelics. Well, basically, I I was trying everything. I mean, this whole experimentation lasted no more than six months, but it, um, it, it, it was, it was, it was, it changed my life profoundly. It it threw you, it threw you into some kind of extreme state or some kind of spiritual state or something. Mm -hmm. Right. Basically the hallucinogens, um, put me into a psychotic manic state that, um, was, um, considered by the professionals, a bipolar mania, it's pretty clear to me in retrospect that I was having a spiritual emergency. It was all extremely spiritually oriented. And um, had I had an opportunity to have a washout period and the proper supports, say something like, you know, Soteria House or just, just someone, you know, willing to acknowledge the value in what I was experiencing rather than um, mocking me when I said God was so you say it was a spiritual experience. What kinds of things were you, you going through? Were you, what, what kinds of things were happening? I, I'm trying to think if I've even written about the content. Not very often. I know I've written about the content once when I talked about my forced, I was forced treated. You know, I was, I was arrested and, and tied up and brought to ER and strapped down and injected with drugs. Were you suicidal or dangerous to anyone? No, no, no none of that above. Um, you were just acting very different. I was acting crazy in, in, the, in the eyes of people who couldn't interpret what was going on. Um, and if you want, anybody who wants can look at, at my, the forced treatment post by look, doing a search in my, in my blog. But just under just forced treatment, it'll come up. But... Um, at that point, what was happening, and this is this this is the only time I really talk about content, and it's the most of it's pretty jumbled and confused and 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 not clear in my mind anymore. But this this was a very clear example, and it's 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 very typical of spiritual emergency that people recover from completely. They have very similar kinds of experiences as the ones that I had, and what was going on in my mind at that point, I had visit I was visiting a. Um, well, I went to a psychic institute that was down the street from my home in Berkeley. And I went there because I thought they would help me. I, I thought, well, I need someone who understands. I obviously knew there was something, you know, beyond the norm happening to me. I understood that. That was clear to me. So I went to the psychic institute for help. I certainly didn't think of going to a psychiatrist. I didn't believe I was crazy. So I went to the psychic institute and I told them that I was Mary, the mother of God, and that I 
uh, was pregnant with the second coming of Christ, who was female, and um, they told me to leave, <laughs> and I refused, and um, that's where I got into trouble. I was not, I did not do anything except sit down on their floor against their wall, and that's all I did. So basically, I was trespassing at that point. That's all. I was not dangerous. I, I, I was not threatening. I did not say anything to anybody that was scary. Of course, abnormal behavior frightens some people, and I, I understand that. That's not. That's not the. That that can be understandable. That's a common story for people to get their first entrance into the mental health system through something very simple like trespassing or a public nuisance or jaywalking or something like that. And then the, it sounds like for you as well, the implications once you got into the system were pretty catastrophic. Oh, yeah. Anyway, what happened was the cops came and I refused to leave. And so they, they picked me up and threw me down the stairs. And... Um, Again, there was no attempt to communicate with me, to ask me how I was doing, to, you know, there was no attempt to understand what was happening to me. I was just a nuisance, a trespasser, someone breaking the law, and for some reason, someone dangerous enough to drop down the stairs. Now, I was a tiny, little, pretty young thing at that point. I mean, I, I did not look threatening, and I was dressed completely appropriately. I was clean. Um, you know, I, was, I, was, I had makeup on. I was, I was extremely... I looked fine. I, I mean, I looked a little funky like any Berkeley kid does. There was nothing wrong with the way I appeared, and yet I got thrown down the stairs because I refused to get up by myself. And I was injured relatively badly, but superficially. I had a very, very bad scrape on my elbow. It could have been much worse. It seems like there's something among a lot of police that if someone is acting kind of crazy, it's almost like the police feel provoked. There's so many stories of, of this kind of brutality just coming out of nowhere that the police just inflict on people because they're in some kind of strange state and they won't communicate. Um, and that's, uh, that's terrible. They threw you down the stairs and you were, you were injured from that. Yeah, and at that point, I did struggle. At that point, okay, these people are trying to hurt me. Of course. So I struggled. And, and once I struggled, I suppose, I don't know, I think they were going to take me away anyway, but I struggled when they tried to put me in the police car at that point. But they'd already abused me. They'd already hurt me. They'd already physically harmed me. So at that point, yes, I struggled, but I did not hit or, you know, I didn't do anything violent. I struggled. I tried to avoid them. You know, when they were grabbing me, I tried to wrestle my way away from them. I was not violent. I was trying to avoid their violence. So anyway, I got, I got thrown into the cop car and I was literally cattle tied. I don't know why they didn't put me in cuffs. They tied me up, arms, arms to ankles, um, wrist to ankles. It, it was like a cattle tie and left me in the car like that and, and brought me to the hospital. Jonna, what year was this? 1985. And then how long were you in the system and what kind of happened to you there? I kind of went in and out of the psych hospital very rapidly, three or four times. Because once I got in there, I was very lucid and I wasn't really all that crazy in some ways. I mean, I, I'd get in front of a judge and they'd let me go immediately. Um, but, but if I was honest with the psychiatrist, they mocked me and... Um, so anyway, I, whenever I got in front of the judge, I got out. So I don't, I'd only stay in no more than a week or two at a time, and, and then I'd complete. Then I'd get rid of all my all the drugs they gave me, and I'd do it again, and I'd repeat it again. And my part of my history is my own fault in that I well, I stopped the drugs, the six month drug, you know, adventure. But a, but like a couple years later, I I had this idea that psychedelics were well. They are an incredibly powerful way to get in touch with your psyche if you're healthy, but I was not, or, or, or I shouldn't say I was not healthy. I don't have, I think I'm more delicate and more sensitive than people who can handle drugs. I, I don't, I'm not anti any kind of drugs really. I, I mean, I don't, I don't support their use either, but I, I understand why people want to use psychedelics and I do think there's powerful evidence that for some people they're life-changing in very positive ways if you look at somebody like Ram Dass or something. Yeah, and I think that it, definitely triggered something very positive and spiritual for you. It's just that you didn't have the support and the care and the kind of guidance um, that you needed to sort of use this tool I effectively. Well, I also believe that for people with delicate systems, and I don't understand why some of us are delicate in this way, we don't need drugs. I have access to these things without drugs, but I didn't figure that out. <laughs> I mean, it took me a while to figure that out. So I did, the re I did this kind of rewind, repeat thing two more times where like two years would go by and I was doing just dandy and um, I, 
I would take a hallucinogenic and boom, land in the hospital again. Can you can you say a little bit about? You mentioned it's a spiritual experience. Say a little bit about what was it that was so spiritual and beautiful and compelling about that experience that you kept wanting to come back to it. I had a sense of oneness with God or the universe at this at this point. In my existence, I don't actually believe in God, though that may change, I don't know, because as I come off drugs, I get more and more in touch with the spiritual again. And I, what happened when I got on drugs, on, on psychiatric drugs, was my spirit died, literally, and I no longer had this conduit to the spirit, which I always had even before drugs, but for some reason, once I discovered the hallucinogenic drugs, I, I, I don't know, I had this desire for this intense um, experience. But what but, but was wonderful, I mean, there were times when I literally spoke, had conversations with God, literally, like, like telepathically, and I was one with the universe, I was one with all human beings, one of the things I'll be reading later, and I've had experiences of that nature without being on drugs. Again, I was, I was young and kind of, I, I, I mean, I, I'm not, I never, I always say when I'm my most honest that, you know, I contributed to all of this. And, and yes, a giant psychiatric in, institution moved in on me in really nasty ways. Yeah, I think that's always true that there's definitely some agency and, and role that we, we ourselves play in any, any kind of situation like this. Absolutely. And what, so what medications were you put on? You said that it really deadened your spirituality. What was it the antipsychotic medications or what were you taking? And then that, that sort of created a long term, you continued to take them for a long term. Is that right? Well, maybe finally give in because I kept on, I struggled against them as long as it was, as it was clearly drug induced. I, I took low, low doses of drugs for several years. Psychiatric drugs, you mean? Yeah, because I had sleep disturbances. But I, I didn't, but I was basically, but I wouldn't take a mood stable. I mean, I wasn't doing what they wanted me to do. I was taking stuff to sleep, and I was taking actually a very low dose of Thorazine to sleep for, for the first five years. I didn't know anything about drugs. I just knew I wanted to sleep. But I've learned how to sleep relatively naturally now. I mean, there are ways to do it with, I mean, you, there are natural supplements that induce calmness. So I was taking low, low, low doses of medications, but what, made me finally say, okay, okay, you're right, I'm bipolar, was when something happened that I didn't think was drug-induced. I went to a holistic healer because I felt depressed. And she, now I didn't know this, I didn't realize this at the time, but in retrospect, now that I understand nutrients, and that's how I treat myself largely, she gave me excitatory amino acids, which for people who have a tendency to get manic or have these kind of energetic states, um, amino acids excitatory amino acids can be very, very dangerous and potentiate problems. And they're also very, very useful for some people. And I use inhibitory amino acids actually to help me sleep now. So, so, so they're, they're, they're good stuff, but they can, they can potentiate problems similar to drugs, but not, they don't have the whole host of other really nasty side effects. So how did the psychiatric drugs affect you and how long were you on them? And then at what point did you decide to start the process that you've been writing about on your blog of coming off psychiatric drugs? I started, they started me off with mood stabilizers and um, neuroleptics or antipsychotics. Really, there's no such thing as an antipsychotic um, in my mind. Neuroleptics are a class of drug that, that chemically restrain your brain and your soul and your being. Yeah, they're tranquilizers. They're actually used by veterinarians to tranquilize horses and dogs and zoo animals as well. They just tranquilize you, basically. You're right. Right. So anyway, yeah, I was on, so they, they started me off early on with, with mood stabilizers and neuroleptics. I've been on 37 different drugs at different times. I mean, from start to finish, 37 different psychotropic drugs. Over how many years? 20, 15, 15, because really 15, because the last many years I was on the same cocktail. What made me finally decide I needed drugs was when I thought pretty much incorrectly that I had a bipolar episode without drug inducement. But in retrospect, I've learned that what triggered it was uh, um, excitatory amino acid. And I was not psychotic at all. I was extremely hypomanic, um, but extremely in tune with the universe, but, but not at all psychotic. 
but still it scared me given my history and I didn't believe I'd taken anything that could trigger such a thing. And so finally I thought, okay, they must be right because here I am having an episode triggered by nothing. When in fact, now I know it was triggered by something. Um, but I didn't know that then. I didn't know that for many years. So once I started taking drugs, um, I felt like, oh, good, that is controlled and I won't lose it because I was scared I'd get psychotic like from hallucinogens, which I, which I, which I was not. And I don't think I would have become psychotic um, having not taken hallucinogens. But anyway, basically all their brainwashing from the previous years worked and I finally get, succumbed and I took all their drugs. So they had me on mood stabilizers and neuroleptics initially, which killed completely that spiritual part of me. And um, completely, I was a spirit, I was a, I was a religious studies major and I never believed in any one faith or, but, but I, I, well, I, I, I actually always remained intellectually fascinated with religion, but I had no longer had a spiritual connection to anything. So how else did the drugs affect you, the psychiatric drugs? Well, the other thing that happened is that I believe that drugs led to more drugs led to more drugs. Um, I don't remember exactly how and when these things happened, but again, in retrospect, each drug they gave me had side effects, and then they gave me other drugs. But some, some instances, it's very clear, like um, antidepressants caused agitation, and that put me on benzodiazepines, which are highly, highly addictive. Well, actually, all these drugs are highly addictive, contrary to popular belief. But anyway, so, so you know, the agitation from the, the, the antidepressant led to the benzodiazepine. The benzodiazepines caused me sedation, along with the neuroleptics and the mood stabilizer, which ultimately led to trials of stimulants, you know, just on and on and on. And, oh, also, Risperdal, nastily enough, you know, can cause akathisia or a kind of inner agitation. Akathisia can be... Mo mobility, like people are restless on the outside and it's visually obvious, but uh, akathisia can also be experienced internally. And I had a lot of akathisia and I didn't know what it was. And they kept on giving me more risperidol, which was causing the akathisia. And they did that. I was on it for years and, and going up, 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 more and more risperidol up to 11 milligrams, which is about, well, when I worked with the so-called severe and persistently mentally ill, I never met anyone on more than three milligrams of risperidol. And I was on 11 they were giving me drugs that were actually giving me, they were giving me a drug to treat the symptom that the drug was causing. They were giving me the same drug. That's how insane it was. And these, these things I didn't figure out until after I started coming off of them and I started feeling relief from symptoms that these drugs were causing, and I didn't even know it. How did you make the decision to stop believing what they were telling you and to start coming off of medications? You know, that was a bit of a... An, a an evolution, but ultimately it led to a conversion of sorts. I always, always thought and believed somewhere inside that there was another way. I always believed that. I he I'd heard about orthomolecular medicine years into it. I mean, early on, you know, nutritional port. And in fact, I'd had an experience because I had, I had PMS before any of this started. And that's really all that I have now, PMS. That's all it ever was. I had PMS and I, I saw a, um, a doctor who treated me nutritionally and changed my life around dramatically within a few months when I followed her nutritional and dietary guidelines. What kinds of guidelines were they just real, real briefly? They're pretty much what I do now. I don't eat any sugar, no refined flours of any kind, very low carbohydrates in general, um, whole foods. I do eat meat. I find meat is extremely important. Someday I hope I'm healthy enough that I can forego meat because I don't like killing animals, but I tried to go with, um, you know, animals that were raised humanely. So whole foods, whole organic foods as much as possible. And so for all these years, no one had really recommended or supported you to just try nutritional approach. And then when you did, when you did try it, you immediately felt better. And that kind of led you to think, well, maybe I need to get off the medications. I just knew that there were other ways because of my experience. I ended up doing neurofeedback with a man who he, he planted the seeds. He had gotten people off of medications doing neurofeedback. And he, he gave me the hope that I could be med free, but he did not have all the answers for my particular situation. He, he certainly neurofeedback can and does work for some people. 
and it's enough. But For people who don't know, what, what is neurofeedback? It's basically biofeedback. It helps retrain brain waves. My brain waves were completely and totally chaotic, probably mostly because of um, the drugs I was on. Well, it's a, form of med- it's a form of meditation where you have a monitor that monitors your, um, your pulse and what's going on electrically with your brain so that you can help um, to relax better and focus your mind better. Is that right? You get feedback from the monitors that help you help your brain waves respond to the feedback and it's all unconscious, but it, it definitely works. I mean, I, I see, I've seen the feedback. I, I've seen the printout of the, of my EEG and, and there are noticeable changes. Yeah. It's very related to meditation. And I have talked to a number of people who've found it effective and it's getting more popular too. People who are listening might be able to, um, you know, track down a neurofeedback and there are no side effects. It's not drug or invasive or anything like that. It's, uh, oh, I, I swear by it and it got me started and there is an article on my website where I explain it a little more intelligently than I'm able to right now. So Jonna, tell us about um, coming off medications. How did you do that? I start actually, I basically started doing research on the internet and becoming members of various withdrawal Yahoo groups and reading everything on the subject that was available which at that time was Bregan and then one of my, my favorite Yahoo group. Did you quit all cold turkey or how did you do it? No, no, no. Cold turkey is dangerous. I would never, ever recommend anyone doing it. Occasionally you hear stories of success, but in general it's dangerous. It's a trip back to the hospital, especially if you've been on them for more than a year and especially if you've been on them more than 5, 10 for me, 15, you know, I've been coming off them now four years, but yeah, I would, I would definitely agree with that. We recommend that people not go cold Turkey, but how did you do it? Did you do one medication at a time? Did you taper off slowly? What was your, uh, what was your technique? For the most part, I did one medication at a time with the exception of when it got too rough. Sometimes I would take a break and then switch medications because I was on such monster high doses. So yes, one medication at a time for the most part, no more than 10% or less Early on, you can do big chunks if you're on really high doses. Like, you know, when I'm on 11 doses of 11 milligrams of Risperdal, the first milligram, it was okay to go one milligram all at once because I was on 11 milligrams. That was less than 10%. But, you know, once I got down to tiny amounts, and this is just an example of how slow I needed to go and how sensitive my body had become and how poisonously toxic these drugs are. Lamictal, which I took, Two year, I started two years ago. I was on 400 milligrams. That's what made me most disabled. I'm extremely disabled. I, can't, I, I often can hardly walk around the house. I often can't have a phone conversation. We've canceled this twice, this, com- this conversation with Will, because I am so exhausted that I can't even speak sometimes. So the effects of the withdrawal, you're experiencing fatigue and physical illness and confusion right. and cognitive problems and... Sounds exactly. like a really rough, really rough process physically. Yes, and with and the lamictal for some reasons for me seems to have been the worst drug, but everybody has their own particular worst drug. I have a housemate, a former housemate, who nearly died from uh, lamictal uh, poisoning. She was a, a patient at Cooley Dickinson Hospital in Northampton. You can read about that on my blog on the Icarus Project. A very scary incident. So yeah, lamictals and. All these drugs are, are very dangerous, and, and you've gone through an incredible journey to get where you are now. Some, what were some of the other obstacles that you came across that you had physical symptoms and emotional, psychological symptoms in the withdrawal? The 400 milligrams of lamictal, which took me two years to withdraw from, at the end I was using, we're talking 400 milligrams, at the end I was using pediatric pills, 5 milligram pills. Most doctors will have you go off in 25 milligram chunks about once every two weeks which is absolutely insane, and, and, and yeah, most people will go crazy and will go right back on drugs. If you do it nice and slow and easy like I did, you may get physically sick, but you won't get crazy, which I have not. I'm physically sick, yes, unfortunately. Do you think it's a detoxification process that your body is just getting all the toxins out and then ultimately you're going to be stronger and starting to feel better physically? Well, that's what I hope. At this point, I really don't know, but the person I consult with most frequently who's worked with people for 20 years calls this chemical and injury, and I, I think that's a very good term. The last final cut I made on Lamictal, and I felt it, was 0.1 
0.25 milligrams. We're talking a fraction of a milligram. And originally I was on 400 milligrams. And that's how our bodies become sensitive. So that what used to affect you at 400 milligrams now affects you at 10 milligrams. And it's a very strange thing, but I see it again and again and again in hundreds of people in all the groups that I talk to and the people who come to me on my website. Yeah, you are a tremendous resource. I mean, your, um, your knowledge and skill, the, just the blog that you have and the number of, vi- of readers that you have and, and all the people that talk with you and email you and comment on your blog. I mean, you're really one of the people I've met who's most knowledgeable about the coming off drugs um, process, and it's, it's amazing what you've done. If you're just tuning in, this is Madness Radio, and we're speaking with Jana Kali, who is a psychiatric survivor and a former social worker in mental health, who has a very popular blog called Beyond Meds about coming off psychiatric drugs. I just want to make sure that we get a chance to read some of your um, some of your writing because you're a really brilliant writer. Do you want to read um, a piece from your from your blog? Yes. Um- I have two pieces I selected. Um, the first one is what I, I, I called it, I, I um, entitled it Undiagnosing Myself. I was diagnosed 23 years ago as bipolar 1 after becoming psychotically manic after ingesting hallucinogens while premenstrual. I've said this many times, but I want to say it now because I'm about to disown my past, finally and completely and grab my future. I became psychotic a number of times, and, because, and that is because I took hallucinogens a number of times. Each time I took them, only if I was premenstrual, I landed in the psych ward. I got my period the next day in each case. This is drug-induced mania. This is PMS on steroids. That's all. I am not bipolar. What I was then heavily medicated for were side effects to drugs and personality quirks or more clinically, a personality disorder or, God forbid, characterological problems. And if you go by the DSM-4, these personality trait tendencies I had were mild. I had no full-blown case of a diagnosable disorder. But I was uncomfortable at times, and my doctor wanted to help with lots and lots of medication. Therapy and a good look at my traumatic childhood was not deemed important. I had a serious biochemical mood disorder, according to them, that would never go away and that I would have to take toxic drugs for for the rest of my life, drugs that would possibly shorten my life 25 years while making me gain 100 pounds and lose many IQ points and make me fatigued and sexless. I lived life without passion for many, many years. My dysfunctional behavior never addressed my life with trauma never recognized. I was never once asked if I had been abused. I've read a number of times that the correlation of childhood abuse and mental illness is extremely high. I can say from personal experience as a social worker with the so-called severe and persistently mentally ill that a good 80%, if not more, were abused in some fashion. Abuse comes in many shapes and forms, and parents need not be blamed in all instances. So there is no doubt that they certainly can be in many cases, but this is anathema in advocacy groups since families just don't want to look at themselves. Sometimes abuse seems benign. This, that is the hardest to call, but emotional abuse counts and most children just don't realize that they, most people just don't realize that they may be doing that to their children. And I might add that as a seriously emotionally abused child, I don't blame my mother. I know she did the best she could and she's a good woman. My father was an abuser, physical, sexual, and emotional, and my mother passed on her emotional messed upness to me. I do blame my father, and my mother is not without responsibility, though I love and forgive her completely. She's a big enough person to own her dysfunction and forgive herself. It doesn't have to be about hating human frailty. It can involve forgiveness and love. I also, while manic, experienced spiritual emergency, I had always been prone to deeply profound spiritual experiences without drugs. Again, on hallucinogens, those experiences cracked, cranked up. But I don't believe I was crazy. Out of control, yes. Out of touch with consensual reality, yes. But crazy, no. I was in touch with some beauty, too. I was in touch with love. From my first post on my blog, here is a story of an experience of love and spirituality. In this altered state, I had many exceptional experiences. I will share one with you. 
I came out of my suite one day to the sounds of people yelling. I looked down the hall and saw a young African-American man wielding a gun pointed at someone who had done him wrong in a drug deal. A veil of peace came upon me. I calmly walked up to the man who was still yelling at his customer with gun in hand. I gently put my hand on his shoulder. He turned, looked at me, seemingly disarmed. I said, you don't want to hurt anyone. Come on, let's go. I took his arm and led him away to the stairwell. We walked down to the first landing and stopped. I spoke to him about love and peace. We hugged, and he left. I don't remember exactly what I said, and I know it, it sounds terribly cheesy, but it worked. I felt a huge sense of power and oneness with humankind. That moment was beautiful and wondrous. It was not cheesy. That was stripped away from me when I was labeled a pathology. Later in life, I would have two more experiences with psychotic men with knives. I was able to talk to them and also disarm them. I was not on psychedelic drugs. I still had that gift. So I'm shedding my label of bipolar disorder loudly and publicly. I've tried to to do this many times that no one really notices. My blog title has, was always Bipolar Blast, a thing of the past. I use the term bipolar so as to call out to all the other people wrongly diagnosed because I believe we are thousands and tens of thousands. The label does nothing but make it easy for psychiatrists to put us into a box. Symptom clusters are called bipolar regardless of cause or ideology. I know people diagnosed bipolar when they are really suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and very often they are suffering from drug-induced mania, as an adverse reaction to an antidepressant that doctors claim magically proves you're bipolar. Other times people are suffering from terrible stress or simple problems with coping with life, which in, which in the spiritually inclined can simply be a spiritual crisis. Changing lifestyle, coming through the crisis, and owning your crap could be the answer, rather than blaming it all on a brain disease and succumbing to the prevailing theory of mental illness. I want to make it clear I do not judge those who take meds. They are a tool, and sometimes they are the only tool someone knows to use. Too often it is not brought to light that there are other tools and that many of us recover, that many of us label schizophrenic, bipolar, schizoaffective, depressed, and anxious, have one or several episodes and move on, the so-called disease worked out. Most of us don't get to find out that that is possible. Many of us don't want to know. We are afraid. I understand this fear intimately. I do not judge. I may seem to because I have passionate opinions, because I'm angry that I've been burned. But when confronted with people I know in my life and anywhere, I encounter people using psychiatric services. I grant that it is one's right and total decision to do what they want with their body. I have many friends who accept their diagnosis and choose to take drugs. So be it. It's nice to live in free as world as possible. I do not wish that we all be the same, live and let live. But this is key. Many of us who do not wish to be drugged are forced to be drugged. We live in, with a mental health system that is coercive, overtly and covertly. This must be challenged and changed. The only thing I fight for is true informed consent. Most people are not informed. Most people do not know all the possibilities that lie behind their diagnosis. I want to save people who might become intractable before it's too late because I believe drugs are often the cause of intractability. So I'm out here saying my bit, trying to lead by example. I'm lucky enough to have escaped the often inevitable downward spiral that never ends. It is never wise to jump off drugs without thoroughly preparing. I have done nothing without taking very good care of myself and addressed and am addressing my emotional dysfunction. Yes, I still have live emotional dysfunction. No one should assume that it is safe to just stop taking drugs. It is a huge commitment and responsibility. I would say that in my case, it is a calling. I was on 11 milligrams of Risperdal, 200 milligrams of Zoloft, 50 milligrams of Seroquel, 400 milligrams of Mictol, and 3 milligrams of Clonopin with up to 6 milligrams as needed a day, and in the end, a variety of stimulants. You have to be called to get off all that. It is a vocation, no joke. I couldn't do it otherwise. So no, I don't judge. After a certain point, it simply becomes behemoth. So now I continue on my journey and I am undiagnosing myself. I am human and I have problems. That is the only diagnosis I am willing to live with now, human problems. My life has not been easy. It has been no different from that of hundreds of thousands of people labeled bipolar. I still consider all who call themselves bipolar my brothers and sisters, and for that matter, anyone else who has ever been labeled with a psychiatric disorder. We are family.
that's it. Gianna, that is, that's so powerful and that's so beautiful. Uh, thank you for writing that and for all the work that you do. Um, this is uh, Gianna Kali and um, her blog on the internet that you can check out is bipolarblast.wordpress.com. I love that, undiagnosing yourself and the only diagnosis is human problems. That just makes so much sense. And it's so touching, the, the spiritual aspect of your experience. Um, how has your blog been received? I know you have a lot of, of loyal readers and uh, what kind of impact have you made and what um, sorts of people have you met? Oh, totally runs the gamut. I have, I would say most of my readers still take meds. And in that respect, I, I think that perhaps I offer hope that to some people that, that, that perhaps someday they'll be free. No one ever likes taking meds, even if they're pro-med, you know, so-called pro-med. No, no one likes taking meds. So I have a significant percentage of readers that, that just want to see what I'm doing and are curious. And then I have a lot of readers who are doing what I'm doing and they're withdrawing from drugs. We, we support one another and some of them are, some of them I know from my email groups, some of them don't participate, but um, get, just use the resources I have on my about page. In fact, it's very, if you guys are, if anyone's interested in withdrawal, my about page has a collection, the largest collection edited by me. There's, I don't include everything that's available because uh, I have, I think some things are better than others, but it has a huge collection of resources for, for alternative care in general and specifically helping withdraw from meds. And that's my about page. It's on the tab, tab at the top of the page. And then, and then I have readers who are recovered and who just like to see my journey because they've gone through something similar. And then I have people who attack me. <laughs> And I've had some really nasty interactions from time to time where people have felt threatened. People often feel very threatened, and it's really unfortunate. Um, you know, they've been trained to think a very certain way, and they've invested so much belief in this is my survival, this is what keeps me alive. And then when somebody comes along and says, well, actually, there's a diversity, it's, there's not just one way. Unfortunately, a, a lot of doctors and psychiatrists get extremely defensive as well. I've run into that a lot, but I'm also seeing that the climate is really changing and there's much more openness to this um, these days. Jonna, do you have any more reading that you'd like to do? I, I just so enjoyed the piece that you just read. It's very powerful. Yeah, I chose one that's kind of like a day in the life because that's like very empowering. This one shows me kind of when I'm not feeling so hot because believe me, I don't feel so hot a lot of the time. I'm, I'm physically disabled. The piece is entitled, I have an accident to prove that, yeah, I probably shouldn't be driving. It was a minor ac accident, but an accident nonetheless. As I've said many times, I'm mostly housebound due to chronic debilitating weakness. Fatigue is a word too many people can claim as their own, everyone having experienced it to some degree. I loathe the word, as it's clear most people have no clue what I'm dealing with when they try to sympathize and tell me how they, too, suffer from fatigue. This is not to dismiss people's well-intentioned attempts at commiseration, as I, too, have suffered from varying degrees of fatigue since I can remember. It's all worthy of being bummed out about. But for two decades of my experience of fatigue caused by drug sedation, I maintained a life that from the outside looked normal. I can no longer do that. I hobble around the house like a 90-year-old, and I apparently drive like one now, too. I hit a parked car. Yep, a parked car in a parking lot. I was turning in to pull up alongside of it and miscalculated the distance. I was not going faster than two miles per hour and likely even more slowly. I put a nice scrape down the side of the car I hit. It was a superficial scrape in that I, there was no denting, but it was a big one. My car, on the other hand, did not make it out so lucky. The bumper is partially disconnected and cracked. I left a note on the car and went into the store and purchased my journal. Yep, I was getting a journal to better document my down and not so downs. I don't really have ups at the moment. I think of my brother dying of cancer often, as I feel that what I experience can't be terribly different, except that hopefully my debilitation will pass without my dying. I have a name for what I'm experiencing now, chemical injury. 
Once I made my purchase, it struck me that I might need to call the police rather than leave the scene, even with a note attached to the car. I had forgotten my cell phone, so I asked the people in the store if I could use their phone. Sure enough, the police said that I could not leave without risking being accused of hit and run, even with a, with a note. So I went out to the car, hoping desperately that I would hold it together until they got there. My state of well-being fluctuates, and sometimes I can barely speak, let alone drive, and the cops were now involved. This was scary. As I sat in my car next to the car I'd hit, I also started fantasizing who the owner might be. I hoped that it would not be some belligerent huge man that would start screaming at me. It was pretty uncomfortable waiting there. After about 10 minutes, a couple of women who turned out to be an adult daughter and mother had opened the trunk and were putting their shopping in it. I exited my car and stammered the reason for my being there. They were gratefully very nice. They sympathized with the greater damage on my car and thanked me for not leaving. They actually showed some disbelief that I had acted so responsibly, saying most people would have left, most likely without even a note. We called the police and they said we could go our separate ways. We exchanged insurance information and said goodbye. I came home and called the insurance company and all is well, the bumper will be repaired, and the injured party, too, will have their car repaired. Except now, I probably really am housebound 100% of the time, rather than 80%. I was very lucky that this accident was so minor and inconsequential. Driving home was very scary. I was shaking and very weak after being out so long. Jonna, where are you now with the coming off medications process? Because I know you're at the very end of it. Is that right? Um, I suppose that's true. I've come off seven or six drugs. I, I lose count. Anyway, I, I think I've come off six drugs, and I, um, I'm doing my seventh, which is the clonopin. Benzodiazepines are extraordinarily nasty to come off of, but as I've found out, not nastier than other drugs. But um, they are very, very nasty. And I was on three milligrams and down to two milligrams. Um, last, yesterday, I was actually down to 1.75 milligrams, and I had to updose to two milligrams because I was such a wreck. Um, I, 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 I was extremely, extremely, um, I don't even know how to, I, I don't even know. I, I don't have words for my experiences. There is no nomenclature for the odd neurological weirdness our bodies go through when, when we're sick from chemical injury. But I knew intuitively that, that I needed to increase my dose back up to two milligrams. And that's one of the hardest things to do and one of the most important things to know when to do. But I also ended up taking two milligrams of Clonopin last night. So I'm okay today. But you say almost the end and I say sort of because I'm on two milligrams of Clonopin and yes, I was on seven drugs and, you know, maximum and triple dose, maximum doses of everything. And in some respects, yes, I'm at the tail end, but two milligrams of Clonopin could conceivably take another year, and there's really no telling. John, we don't have a lot of time left, but I wanted to ask you um, and maybe leave the listeners with just a question about what sorts of, of changes would you like to see in, in society as a whole? Because so much of what you've done has been you know, kind of on your own and also just researching yourself and finding resources and and how would you like to see the mental health profession change and the society change so that people can get the support that they need? Well, first and most importantly, options need to be given at the very beginning so nobody ever has to go through 20 years on drugs and realize they're being poisoned. So if options are given at the beginning, true options for alternative care, and they're encouraged if the person wants to embrace them, that's, that's the first and most important thing. Those of us who've been on drugs for 20 years, well, we're kind of, we're just kind of out of luck, and we we have to we have to deal. If we want to come off drugs, we have to do it pretty much on our own, because doctors don't have the information. So the second thing that needs to be done for people who are as unlucky enough to get onto drugs and realize they want to come off is really intensive research needs to be done on the withdrawal process, and there has been none. Everything that I know is purely anecdotal. I, I trust the anecdotal experiences that I read because I literally have access to thousands of them at this point. So I have no doubt that what I'm doing is scientifically backed by tons and tons of anecdotal evidence. And once you've read it, as many stories as I've read and followed as many email threads on various issues as I have, if you have a mind for detail at all, you, you see 
things happening over and over and over again. So I have no doubt that what I'm doing is relatively sound. The thing is, we don't know if it was if it if it were studied how much better we could get at doing this. Jana, we are just about out of time. Can you um, give us again your website address and how people can get in touch with you? Okay, my um, website address is Bipolar Blast all one word, dot wordpress.com. There's contact information on my website if you want to contact me. I greatly appreciate this time. I feel like I could have said so much more. Well, we'll hope to get you back on the show sometime soon. Jana Kali, thank you for joining us on Madness Radio today. Okay, thank you very much. You've been listening to an interview with uh, Jana Kali. Jana is a former social worker, and she's a psychiatric survivor who has a very popular blog called Beyond Meds on the process of coming off psychiatric medications. You can find out more by going to the website, which is bipolarblast.wordpress.com. We are out of time this week on Madness Radio. Thanks a lot for tuning in.
You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio broadcasts every Tuesday, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern, on Pacifica Affiliates WXOJLPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD Kasilof and Anchorage, Alaska. Co produced by peer run mental health communities Freedom Center.org and The Icarus Project.net. Madness Radio is hosted by Will Hall. Music producer is John Rice, with technical assistance from Jeremy Lansman. Listen to our internet stream, podcasts, and show archives at madnessradio.net. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness, radio to help get us broadcast on a station near you or if you just want to share what's in your head contact radio at madnessradio.net